Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Tax Talk with the Real Estate Guys, how you can pay less tax legally, ethically, and easily. This is part of our series on the Trump tax secrets, because there's a lot in the news about Donald Trump making lots of money and paying very little in tax. And as we learned in our first episode, Tom Wheelwright uh, taught us that the way you make your money and what you invest in and the facts in your case determine how much tax you pay. Let's welcome back CPA and bestselling author Tom Wheelwright. Hey, Tom. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me back. I'm looking forward to this. Well, we talked in theory last time. It was awesome. And I know we learned a ton. I learned a ton. And I've been hanging around you a long time. But what I think is really important is for people to see an actual history, a case study, folks that have done this. Of course, in your practice today, you don't do that many tax returns, but you do a few, including uh, our, our other guests today. Uh, but the idea is that every tax situation is different. And sometimes the best thing you can do if you're going to pay a lot of taxes, figure out some real estate to buy. And that's really what our, our case study is today. So let's say hello to the man we call the apartment king. Mr. Brad Sumrock is with us today. Hey, Brad. Hey, I'm excited to be here. Let's rock and roll. Hey, we're glad you're here. Thanks for taking time out of your vacation. Uh, and we appreciate you sharing with us. Uh, take us back to uh, pre-Tom Wheelwright, if you will, before Tom was doing your taxes. And uh, tell us about what drove you to figure out a better way. Well, it's pretty. So I've been doing apartments for 18 years and um, have accumulated or controlled over 18 years about 5,600 units. And then as you guys know, I also have an education and, and, and mentoring organization where I help other people. And up until about the middle of 2017, I would talk about apartments for the cash flow and for the NOI appreciation, which are two great things that we get from owning apartments. And I would also talk about how we uplift communities and all those things are true. However, because I was paying a lot of taxes, I wasn't really I like to, to teach what I do. And so at one point I had a goal to pay a million dollars in taxes because I just thought like, hey, you know, if you're really successful and you make a lot of money, then you pay a lot of money in taxes. And, you know, and if I make a dollar, I'm okay with giving 40 cents away. And I used to think that until one day I was speaking, I think, Robert, it was at one of your events. And, um, and, and look, I had, a, I had a CPA too. It's not like I didn't have a CPA, but he was happy if he found like a home office deduction where I can get like a $6,000 annual savings. And hey, he was happy, I was happy. Uh, and then I met Tom and Tom heard me speak and he said something along the lines of, Tom, you remember this? He said, Brad, I heard you say that you pay 900,000 in taxes and your goal is to pay a million. And, uh, and also Kenny McElroy was there and he's like, Brad, I own more apartment units than you and I don't pay as much tax as you said you're paying. And so you need a new CPA. And Tom happened to be there. And so that is the before and the after is before Tom, we were paying uh, in 20, was a tax year 2017, we paid 935,000 in taxes. And in 2018, 2019, and now again for 2020, we will pay zero in taxes on over four to five million of, of income before depreciation. So like Tom has saved us um, seven figures in taxes now for going on three years in a row. Awesome. Well, Tom, we'll write, we talked about this at the uh, first session that we did here. And in theory, when you pay a lot of money, you pay a lot of tax. But of course, your book, Tax-Free Wealth, is all about the fact that if you do it right, you don't have to pay a lot in tax. So take us through your side of the equation. You saw Brad as a high income earner doing apartments at a big scale, and yet he was paying $900,000 a year in tax. Yeah. In fact, when, when Brad said that to me, I go, are you out of your mind? I'm going, <laughs> Seriously, remember, Brad? I mean, I'm going, are you crazy? You want to pay a million dollars in tax? I'm going, who wants to pay a million dollars in tax? You're a real estate professional. You do this as a business. I said, you should be paying zero. And uh, so, so Brad and I had that conversation and Brad goes, what? And I'm going, yeah, I mean, seriously, I mean, I, I just don't understand why you would be paying any taxes as a, you know, I mean, as much real estate as you have, it's like Kenny said, you know, I've, I've known Kenny for years and years and years, and I know 
he pays very little in tax. And I'm going, I, I just don't understand. So, you know, then it was a matter of just, you know, helping Brad understand, um, Brad, you know, really, I think it was this conversation back and forth about, all right, what are the benefits? And, and in fact, you were even looking at, wow, the market's kind of hot right now. Do I even want to invest? And I'm very excited to be um, looking at this deal with the three of us um, because uh, I've seen this multiple times where, you know, the tax law, as I've said before, is a series of incentives, right? And what it's doing is it's saying, it wants you to do something. In fact, the, the tax law wants you to be rich. I mean, that is absolutely the way the tax law works. It doesn't want you to pay a lot of taxes, wants you to be rich. And if you do what the tax law says, typically what I find is, is that while you don't ever want the tax tail wagging the dog, so you never want to do it just for tax purposes, frequently what happens is, is it's a motivation that you didn't have before. And Brad, I, I think that's what happened with you, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm so glad I bought the deal. And I, and and honestly, now looking back, not just for the taxes, but Tom, like you mentioned, the the initial catalyst for me buying this deal in 2018 was to have more direct ownership in a property, so I can get more of the depreciation. Okay. So I syndicate deals and syndicating deals is great for controlling more units, right? And, and, and leveraging your income and putting in a little bit of money and controlling a lot of doors and helping a lot of families and helping your investors. But because you don't own all of the, you don't have all of the ownership, you don't get all the depreciation. So you only get the depreciation that, that it goes toward your ownership. So I still syndicate deals and syndication is a big part of what I do. And because we um, have, you know, income from other sources, right? We have income from other businesses, from coaching, from brokerage, from mentoring, from other apartment buildings. So we have this high taxable income. And so Tom, what you taught me was we need to have more ownership in these buildings and so um, we went out and bought a, a building just under $12 million. And we have one minority partner that had like 19% of the deal in that property. So we got 81% of the depreciation and he gets 19%. And that gave us like a seven figure tax savings. So we did it again in 20, uh, 2019. And in that deal, we have 96% ownership. And we, and we have the same investor that only has 3.5. He wanted more. And I said, no, we need more. We need more of the depreciation for this one. So we were going to do 96%. And so we're going to do it again in 2020. But Tom, you're absolutely right. Is that, I mean, look, I've been doing apartments for 18 years. And I'll just say this about apartments, you know, and everyone has a different theory, but I'll just tell you mine. Every deal I bought, I felt like I was overpaying. <laughs> I'll say it again, like, Every deal I bought, I thought I was overpaying. And every deal two years later, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I thought I was overpaying for that deal. And now I wish I would have bought everything that I could have. And that's true in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2008, 2010, 2000, 2018, I thought I was overpaying for that deal. And so I did it mainly because I was gonna get these tax savings. But now as we go into the numbers, this deal is like worth so much more than what I paid for it. Well, Brad, that's you know? a good point. I remember when this first happened and you were looking at this deal, we did a radio show on this back in 2018. And you said, you know, the deal was close to, to being a good deal. It wasn't fabulous. It wasn't off the charts. But as soon as you factored in the tax savings, all of a sudden it got very interesting. And now a couple of years later, we're going to hear how the story continues. I won't say how the story ends, but where we are today. Uh, but let's go ahead and go through the numbers. Let's specifically look for folks that are saying, well, how is it that you actually save taxes by investing in real estate? Uh, Brad's going to show exactly what they did with their first uh, uh, post Tom Wheelwright uh, deal in 2018. And then again, in 2019, we'll go through those numbers as well. So take us take us through the first deal. Yeah. So this, this is just a picture of the property that me and Jennifer bought in June of 2018. It's in North Dallas, Texas. It's 124 units, Berkshire Square. Now, I'll also say that I like to buy uh, C and B properties. So you look at this, it's not 
uh, a brand new property. It's built in 1969, okay? But it's in a really good area with a lot of jobs and a lot of population growth and a low crime, okay? And the median household income of then one mile is almost 50,000 a year. So it's a, it's a good, healthy, you know, it's still working class, but it's a good, healthy working class demographic. So can I go to the next slide and show you some of the numbers? Yeah, let's, uh, let's go through the numbers. Okay. So now, Tom, I just want you to know that these numbers are not the exact numbers that are in my tax return, but they're pretty darn close. Okay. So I put these numbers in my educational presentations and I just kind of round up. So you see a lot of even, even numbers and zeros and stuff like that. So we, yeah. So we paid 11.7 million and that is an exact number. And I'll say that our year one projected, first, I just want to talk about the cash flow and what it's worth because I want to demonstrate that it's a really good deal in hindsight, even before the tax savings. But I also want to say that the way I projected the deal to be was, was a lot more conservative. Okay. So we projected, you know, more vacancy and we projected more uh, lower rent growth and even higher expenses. And so our year one cash flow projections were less than 300,000. But after we've owned it for a year, that was what we got the first year. And by the way, we've had it two years now and it generates 450,000 a year right now, by the way. Awesome. So that's not bad, by the way, 450,000 a year. Um, the current value after one year was 14 million and we paid 11.7. Uh, and, and again, it just blows my mind, Tom, because if, if it wasn't for the tax benefit, According to my conservative underwriting, it was kind of a marginal deal and I may not have even bought it. Okay. But the, the market is on steroids and I can tell you it still is, by the way, because people need a place to live. And so cap rates are just coming down. Okay. Even, and even now during COVID, cap rates are coming down. So the value today, by the way, is about 17 million, believe it or not, but it was 14 million after a year. So now I want to get into the taxes. And so this is a big thing that Tom taught me uh, that my previous CPAs, um, they weren't so um, bullish on, okay? I've heard of cost segregation before, and, and Tom, I've heard, it, heard of it before, but I've, I've had CPAs that advised me that it may not even be worth it to do it, okay? Well, and we about talked about this in the first segment, but Tom, why don't you give us a quick overview about cost segregation and bonus depreciation. So, so, so look, cost segregation, I'm just gonna draw this really quick and I'll explain it as I draw it. So think about this, when you buy a property, you're really buying four different categories of property. You're buying land, which gets no depreciation deduction, okay? So, so that's a 0% depreciation deduction, right? You're buying the building, which that gets in multifamily, that's about a 3.6% depreciation deduction. So, you know, that's probably basically what you were taking um, before was land of zero and then the rest of it at 3.6%, right? The 3.6% on the building is figured out by the 27.5 year straight line depreciation. So if you take 27.5 years, it's 3.6% a year over 27 years allows you to depreciate it to zero. So that's the straight line. And that's what I was doing before, Tom, is I just did straight line depreciation. Right, and, and that's fairly common. I, I Believe it or not, Robert and um, Brad, I've actually um, seen discussions on uh, CPA, between CPAs. I mean, some CPAs even asking, are cost segregations legal? And I'm going, not only are they legal, but according to the tax law, they're actually required. Now, the IRS doesn't require them, but if you follow the, I, the, the tax law to the, to the, you know, dyed in your eyes and crossing your T's, you would actually be required to do a cost segregation. 
Now, land improvements, that includes your, you know, all of that beautiful landscaping that we saw at Berkshire, um, <clears throat> all of the, you know, the sidewalks, the, the uh, you know, any kind of land improvements, any kind of landscaping, any kind of outdoor lighting, all of that. And typically, that's going to be um, depreciated somewhere between 5 to 10% per year. And then we have um, a really big part, which, you know, anybody who's in apartment investing like you are, Brad, you, you know that a big part of what you're buying is really what we call the content of the, of the property. And that's normally depreciated roughly at, roughly at 20% a year. Okay. Now, what happened in 2000, um, what happened in 2017 is that all changed and this right here went from 5 and 10%, 20% to 100%. So, and that's part of the change in the tax law. Correct. That was the change in the Trump tax bill. 2017 changed it to be able to deduct that entirely in the very first year. So Brad, if you bring back up your, um, your slide there, we can actually see just how big a number that is on an $11 million property. Yeah, so thanks, Tom. So uh, going back to the cost segregation and bonus depreciation, Tom, that you just explained. So you know, we bought the deal in, in, in June of 2018, and then we, you, we hire a company to do the cost segregation study. And so um, they segregate the 27.5-year property the five-year property and the 15-year property. And then like Tom just said, all that five and 15-year property, uh, you could take now in year one, okay? So not only are we doing the cost segregation, Tom, that my previous CPA didn't really advise me to do, but then the tax laws change. And so all that cost segregation items, you could accelerate into the, the year of acquisition. So on an $11.7 million deal, a certain percentage of that is gonna be land, which is not depreciated. But the other reason I like buying in like Texas and Florida is that the land isn't a large percentage of your total acquisition cost. You know, there's some people buying in like Seattle and California, and I, I don't wanna go there, but I don't buy in these markets, and there's a lot of reasons why, but one of them is the land value is so expensive. So, you know, if you pay 11.7 million, in like the DFW working class submarkets, about 11 million is gonna be the building and the contents. And so, you know, a certain percentage of that is gonna be building and then there, it's 27 and a half years and then you're gonna have the five year and the 15 year. So out of that 11 million, about three and a half million is gonna be your five and 15 year property that you could take in year one. So how that worked for us, and we could see it on the slide, our cash flow is 300K. Now we have a year one depreciation loss of 3.5 million. And so that's a net loss of 3.2 million. So A, we're not paying tax on the cash flow. Okay, and B is we have this $3.2 million loss and then say, well, what do I do with that net loss? And this is where that net loss, and, and Tom, I'll, I'll toss it back to you, but in our case, we could take that and that loss because we're qualified real estate professionals and we could take that and that loss and offset income that we get from our real estate related activities. So for us and for many other investors out there, by the way, if they're like married filing jointly and one of them's doing real estate full time, then they're doing this too. Okay. Um, and so you could potentially take this net loss and offset income. And so that's what we're able to do. So in 2017, we paid 935,000 and we had a, like a 1.184 shift in our taxes from paying 935,000 to actually getting $135,000 refund. And then I just put as a kicker, oh yeah, and by the way, the equity went up by $2.3 million too. Excellent. And, yeah, and then, and then Tom, the other thing that you pointed out to me, which is I want to point out is that I think of the 124 families that are at this property, 
And we put in a lot of renovation into this property too. And so if we didn't buy this deal, we've, we've improved the lives of the community, okay? So it's not just me and Jennifer benefiting from this. Or well, in the syndicate, you know, it's not just the investors benefiting from it, it's the residents are benefiting from it, the community is benefiting from it. And, and that's actually the reason for this, okay? That's the reason for this tax policy in the first place is because you, you did, you upgraded this, this property, you made it better. And by the way, those upgrades were also deductible. So, you know, you took the, the initial purchase price, but also any upgrades also got that, those kinds of deductions. And then for those, some people, you know, you go, well, I don't have $3.2 million of income. Well, here's the good news. In 20, at, because of the CARES Act, of 2020, you can actually carry back losses from 18, 19, and 25 years. So even if you hadn't had $3.2 million of income to offset in 2018, in 2020, you'd have been able to carry it back and gotten that money back from five years of carry back. So, um, you know, this is where the, the CARES Act actually compounds this tax saving um, to really encourage people to, you know, let's, let's keep that, that economy going is the idea behind the policy. All right. So the first case study here, Brad, you're paying almost, you know, a million dollars in tax and literally got a tax deduction for investing in property that the cash flow increased because of some of the things you did that you spent money on and got deductions for and the value of the property went up. So that's great for your holding. That's great for obviously lowering your tax bill uh, and you wanted to do it again. So the next year you looked at uh, your situation again, sat down with Tom and decided we need to buy another building. Let's take us through uh, that, that case study if you would. Yeah, and again, just to and Robert, I, I'm gonna I'm just to just so everyone's clear too. I'm syndicating deals as well, okay. And syndications again, they, there's so many benefits, but the one downside is is because you don't own the whole deal, you're sharing the depreciation with all your other investors, and so if you have a lot of earned income, you're not offsetting enough, okay. So we we syndicated two deals, and I looked at we so every every six months, I meet with Tom and his team and we project our income and we project our depreciation. And then that sets into motion, okay, how much more real estate do we need to own? So for, for, um, for 2019 tax year, the, the numbers got even better. Okay. We say we saved 1.5 million. So we bought this beautiful property and there's four pictures. It's all the same property. This is a 1980s construction, um, you know, a near almost a class B asset in Arlington, Texas. And so we found this deal. And again, based on the preliminary underwriting, I was like, oh, you know, I, if it wasn't for the tax savings, I probably wouldn't have bought it. It would have been like, oh, it's okay. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't that excited about 8%. I mean, now, honestly, 8% is a really good yield right now, by the way. I mean, that's why money keeps coming to apartments, by the way, is 8% yield is really good. Where else, you know, you're not getting that in hotels and office and restaurants right right now, especially during the pandemic. But with the, with the tax savings, this pushed me and Jennifer over the edge again and said, hey, we need something that's going to offset our, our taxes. And so on, on this slide, I have a little bit more granularity into what Tom explained. Now, ironically, if we look at step one, we paid the exact same price as the previous deal. So that- But you got a couple, you got a few less units. So I guess that's inflation. Yeah, it was 120 units instead of 124. So that was the difference between 2018 and 2019. You're absolutely right. Um, now I talked before and you heard Tom talk about the land value. And so in this example, Tom, could you believe that only 5.6% of the total purchase price was allocated to land? And this is done by, by the cost segregation company. Okay. So that means that we can depreciate 11 million and 40,000. And on this example, I went through a little bit more detail. So we can see if I had done only the straight line depreciation, then it's gonna depreciate it, the number Tom said, 3.6% a year, which is 27.5 years. And so we would get 
$401,000 a year. Now that's not bad, right? It's not terrible, but more depreciation sooner is better. Right, Tom? If you want your money, it sure is. Yeah, I mean, more depreciation sooner is always better. Okay? Well, I think the point is, Brad, right before you discovered this, uh, and a lot of people are like that, you probably, we probably have real estate investors watching that have bought property and they just figured, well, if it's commercial property, it's depreciation, the schedule is 39 years, if it's residential, 27 and a half, and that's what, what I'm going to do. Cost segregation, though, is the way to get at the various components that Tom spoke about. And you do have to have this done by an actual third party company. You don't just to go get to go to the clipboard and, you know, say, oh, I think it's this much. Talk about that part of it, Tom. Why is yeah. it so important that somebody works in conjunction with uh, an engineering firm and a CPA? Well, and that's a good point. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Brad, when you do a cost segregation study, it has to be done by a third party. So Tom, maybe take us through that. Why is it that I can't just go through with a clipboard and decide what these various per percentages are? I have to hire an engineering firm and a tax firm to do this work. Well, there's actually two good reasons for it, Robert. Um, the first is the IRS requires it. Okay, that should be reason enough. Uh, the IRS says in their audit guide that you have to have a full study with pictures, engineering, and all of that, else the IRS is going to disallow it, okay? They're going to push it back to land, uh, land and building. That's what they're going to do. On the other hand, not only is the IRS require it, but my experience is that people who do it on their own um, don't pick up nearly as big a number as the professionals do. And part of that's because when they go into the engineering, remember they're picking up certain things, certain kinds of wiring, they may be picking up part of the plumbing, they're picking a lot of stuff up that you wouldn't ever know about if you didn't have an engineer do it. And so while you may pick up the dishwashers, you know, um, <laughs> and you know, some of those things, you're gonna leave out, uh, maybe leave out a lot of the cabinetry, you may leave out a lot of the flooring, there's all sorts of things that you're going to leave out. And on top of that, the IRS is going to deny it. So it's a very small price um, for, for the benefit. I mean, especially when you have bonus depreciation. But um, as, as Brad will show you, even without the bonus depreciation, the cost segregation makes a lot of sense. All right. So uh, where were we, Brad? Take us back to uh, the case study. Yeah, excellent. So... I think I have to give you, oh no, there you go. You're sharing. Okay, good. Yeah. So back to the case study. So I, what I did here on, on, on uh, the first point was, you know, we talked before about land not being able to be depreciated. And one of the things I like buying in the markets that I like to buy in is a very, very small piece. In this case, only 5.6% of the $11.7 million price is land. Okay. So that means I get to depreciate 94.6%. 4% of the purchase price. Right. So that's 11.11 million 40,000. Now, if you just look at the straight line, which is the way I was doing it with my accountant before I met Tom, is you could take uh, over 27 and a half years. So that's 3.6% of that uh, depreciable value per year. And that's about 400K. Now that's not terrible. You know, that, that's going to offset your, your taxes on your cash flow and maybe then some but if you look at point number four, by doing the cost segregation study, the engineer goes in and they identify $3.1 million worth of five-year property. And so that's going to be depreciated over five years. So you get an additional $622,000 a year from those uh, items. And then he identified uh, more items that are part of the 15-year property. So that's going to be, again, $63,000 a year over 15 years. And then you still get the remaining 6.97 million, which is your 27.5 your year property. So just doing the cost segregation prior to the bonus depreciation rules that came into in effect at the end of 2017, you get 939,000 of depreciation from the cost segregation, which is more than double of doing the straight line. Okay, so that's better. You can see I have straight line is good. It's not really good, but it's 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 good. It's okay. Then you have better. Yeah, it's okay. And, and then you have better, which is the cost segregation. But the best case 
now, and, and Tom, I think this is through the end of 2023, right? The way the current tax law is structured. So one of the reasons why now is such a great time to be an apartment investor is that we have a limited window just for a few short years where you can take all that five year and 15 year property and accelerate it into the year of acquisition. And the cool thing is all you have to do is close on the property. Like if I close on a deal December 30th, I don't just get one day of depreciation for 2020. If I close on it in 2020, I could take that whole bonus depreciation in the year of acquisition. And so it's a big deal. So this is why Tom, I think, and, and Robert, I was just telling you guys before we started the recording, but I found another deal and it's, you know, middle October and I'm going to close another deal this year and get another $12.5 million. Um, it's a $13 million deal and then 500000 or so will be land and, and I'm going to have another, you know, $1.4, $1.5 million deduction for 2020. So it'll be three years in a row. And again, if I didn't... Um, start working with Tom, I may have never uh, come to this conclusion on my own. Well, you know, Tom, I'm hearing that paying zero tax can be quite addicting to people. Well, you, you, you look at this, okay? So had Brad not done this in 2019, he'd have paid another $1.5 million of tax. If he didn't do it in 2020, he'd pay another $1.5, $2 million in tax. But let me just kind of walk you through a couple of things here. Remember, Okay, so the bonus depreciation starts phasing out after 2022. Okay, so we have two more, two more years after 2020, assuming things don't change uh, with a, you know, if we have a new president, et cetera. Um, but we have, we probably have two more years. Okay, and then it starts phasing out after that. Now, consider this though. If you were doing just cost segregations, you'd still get the same benefit after five years. You, as long as you keep doing that, this is the, this is what the tax law wants you to do. The tax law is saying, keep doing it, and we'll keep giving you the benefit uh, from doing that. Now, here's the other part I want to point out, uh, uh, Robert. <laughs> $1.5 million, okay? Now, that's real money to Brad. Uh, now, if I calculate 75% loan to value, that means that the government is going to give Brad a $6 million property for free. That is the equivalent of 1.5 million, get you a $6 million property, right, Brad? Yeah, and I, so you're coming up with that by saying, I'm gonna put 1.5 million down and get a right. $4.5 loan to buy a $6 million deal, exactly. Right. So that's a 75% loan to value, not an unusual deal, right, from uh, in, uh, in, uh, in multifamily. So I'm going, it's literally like the government is willing to give you a cash flowing property for free. And I'm going, why aren't we doing this? Well, you know, when you have the, the, the challenge with my profession, okay, and this is why we have starting to build this uh, wealth building network of, of CPAs, is that a, a lot of my profession, they don't understand this. And they would be, they're going, it's $400,000 a year. That, you know, you should be happy with that. That'll offset your income. Let's say your income's 400,000. Okay, well, great. So you're not paying any tax on that. That's, that's great. But 1.5 is just a lot better than, you know, saving tax on $400,000 of income, and which would be about 150,000. So it's like 10 times the amount. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have 10 times the money now than wait you know, 30 years for my money. So Tom, a couple of things that have come up that uh, I want you to clarify for us. Uh, Brad mentioned the idea of being a full-time real estate professional. So uh, let's talk a little about that. And then the other side, which you talked about, Brad, is that when you invest passively in a syndication or actively in a syndication, you're only getting a portion of the write-off, but you do get some write-offs. So can you talk about the tax benefits for passive versus active versus real estate professional, Tom? Yeah, sure. So, and there are actually three different categories. There's passive, um, active, and there's real estate professional. But what I really want to focus on is the, the passive and the real estate professional, because the active is only for those who are under $100,000 of income. So let's look at, so single family homes are fine for those people, but, you know, multifamily is going to be a little challenging. All right. So 
what real estate professional, we all have, you know, colloquial meanings for words, right? But real estate professional doesn't mean you have a brokerage license, okay? It might mean you have a brokerage license, but you could be a, you could be in construction and be a real estate professional, or you can just have, you could just be managing your own properties and still be a real estate professional. So real estate professional, if you see this, this term REP from an accountant or when somebody's talking about tax, that means real estate professional. And there are two simple rules. You have to meet both rules, but they're really simple. Okay, rule number one, Rule number one is that you have to work more than 750 hours in real estate. And it's gotta be in real estate that you own, a real estate business you own. So if you're an employee for a real estate broker, that doesn't count, okay? You have to either own, it has to either be on your own real estate or your own business, all right? Okay. Number two, it has to, your time in real estate has to be greater than everything else you do business-wise, okay? So I'm just gonna say all, all else, okay? Or all other, right? It's everything else that you do. So for example, now, now Brad is really what I'd call a full-time real estate professional. I mean, that's all he does, right? Um, but uh, I know a lot of people where uh, they have a, not, a spouse that's a stay-at-home spouse, okay? Well, that stay-at-home spouse, that's like 15 hours a week is all. If they're not, if they don't have other business activities, 15 hours a week is all it takes, 15 to 20 hours and you're home free. 20 hours a week is a thousand hours a year and that's plenty to qualify as, a, qualify as a real estate professional. Now, clarify one thing, as Brad was talking, um, Brad, um, it's once you're a real estate professional, you can offset any kind of income. So you can offset your spouse's wages from being a doctor, Okay, so you can you can offset offset business income. You can offset any kind of income if you're a real estate professional and you meet this test. So this is truly what I call your get out of jail free card. Um, so you can do this. Now, some people are like me and my wife. Now, you guys both know my wife and you know that she's as crazy as I am and she's a tax nerd like I am and has her own CPA firm. And we're never going to be real estate professionals. We're just not. Okay. So well, because although happens. you own real estate and although you understand real estate tax is your more than half. That's my problem is I'll never meet the more than half. Okay. Yep. Because I spend so much time in my other businesses. I'm, a, I'm absolutely, I, I, I invest um, both passively and I invest, I have my own buildings. Okay. So I would qualify if, that's all I did, but I, that's not all I do. Okay. So what do I do? Well, now what we have is this rule called passive activity loss. Okay. We call them PALS. Okay. And that means that your loss is passive. It doesn't mean you don't get it. Okay. It means two things. First of all, it will offset what we call a pig a passive income generator. That's why we say pig, in the tax world, pigs are our pals, okay? That's an easy way to remember it. So we'll offset passive income or, or it will offset when you sell the property, okay? So let's say for example, that you've got, and I'm gonna give this example because it's, it's actually a pretty cool example. Let's say that you have, just $100,000 of losses. And they've carried over for the year, over the years, right? So you have $100,000 of losses over here, okay? And then let's say when you sell the property, you have $100,000 of gain. Let's say you did, okay? Now you go, wow, that's just a wash. Only it isn't a wash. And here's why, because hundred thousand dollars yes that loss gets freed up i'm gonna put it this around it so we know it's a loss that gets freed up when we sell this but this gain is going to be taxed at 20 percent 
And this loss gets to be used against 37% income. So I'm net $17,000 better. Now, I realize that I just went through that really fast. So I'm hoping people watch this and listen to this over and over and over again, because that's how we learn is by repetition. And but it wouldn't have hurt for them to pick up a copy of Tax-Free Wealth, just saying. But not hurt at all, okay? And I walked through this there too. But, but consider that you could end up in a situation pretty easily. And this happens all the time. By the way, I see this all day long because I have doctors who, you know, there's, uh, I have a client that both, um, are high earning doctors and they're actually employees. Okay. They're both employees of the hospital. So there's no way they're ever going to be real estate professionals. And in fact, for them, there's no way even to create passive income. So this is just carrying over. But when, whenever a property sells and they've been investing for a year, so this happens every year now. Okay. They've got this gain, but it's only being taxed at 20%. Whereas the loss is giving them a deduction that's worth 37% because they're in a 37% ordinary tax bracket. So they actually benefit by $17,000, even though the gain is exactly equal to the loss. And so that's why we say, sometimes we talk like in tax-free wealth, we talk about you have good, better, and best income. Okay, best income would be if you had passive income because it would offset immediately. But guess what? Investment income, is really good too, because it's only tax at 20%. That's why you want to do syndications, right, Brad? Because your carried interest in those syndications is taxed at 20%, not 37%. So, so, so that carried interest is a better type of income. But the best kind of income, of course, is, and of course, passive is always good. You're still going to get this good, good benefit. So my point is, is that people, I hear this all the time. In fact, literally, I'm talking to the CPA for a fairly sizable real estate uh, developer. And I'm asking the CPA, I'm going, how come I'm not seeing depreciation on this K-1 for my client? So, well, we don't do cost segregations. I said, why not? Because, well, because our investors don't get the losses. And I'm going, okay, first time out. First of all, they actually do benefit, okay, right here. Second of all, my, my clients, who happen to be some of their investors, actually, we do create losses. So, rest of the story, even though my wife and I are both, neither one of us is a real estate professional, I get most of my passive losses. Why is that? Because guess what? I don't own all of my businesses. My kids own some of my businesses and they're passive. So, for them, it's passive income. They own the real estate, it's passive loss. Now they offset currently. So all I'm saying is, I know this sounds complicated, but my point is, is that, you know, challenge your CPA on this because this is a big deal. I mean, it's not just, could I be a real estate professional or my spouse be a real estate professional? It could be, wow, I've got an offset when I sell or maybe I could restructure my business holdings, right? maybe avoid some estate tax while I'm doing it and get my passive losses now. So, you know, as, as I always say, Robert, you've heard me say it over and over again, Brad, you've heard me say, it. if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts. facts. Okay. So sometimes we can change our facts here, but without a cost segregation, we're stuck and there's nothing we can do unless we buy the real estate. I mean, if Brad hadn't bought the real estate, it wouldn't get in the tax benefit nor would he have gotten all the appreciation and the cash flow. But that's the point. That's the whole point of the tax law. That's what the tax law has been doing for the last 70 years, 60, 70 years, is incentivize certain behavior. Most recently, the big incentive, real estate. So Brad, at your trainings, you talk about the three different ways to invest in apartment buildings, which is you can invest like you and Jen do in your own buildings, your own properties, you get all the deduction. You can invest as a passive investor where all you do is give the money to a promoter, a syndicator, a deal sponsor, or you can be that deal sponsor. And of course, each of those has the various tax benefits Tom's talking about. But take us through some more examples. Uh, I know you've got some more thoughts to share there. And go ahead yes. and share your go ahead and share your slide there. 
Thanks, Robert. Yes, yeah, so me and Jen actually do all three of those things that you just mentioned that we teach. So we, we teach what we do. So we syndicate deals for the leveraged income. We buy our own deals with our own money for uh, not just for the depreciation, but that's a big catalyst for us doing those types of investments. And we also invest passively because truthfully, there's so many deals out there that we can't possibly be looking at all the deals. And so we love to invest passively. So like passive investors benefit too. Now, obviously it's subject to what Tom said, but if they have a, a good accountant, you know, here's the deal. Every investor in a syndication is going to get a Schedule K-1. And every investor is going to get their pro rata share of ownership. Uh, they're going to get their pro rata share of depreciation based on their ownership percentage. Okay. So in this deal that um, this is the, the deal that Jennifer and I bought in 2019, we own 96.5% of that deal. And we have one investor that just wanted to put in like 150 K. Okay. So he owns three and a half percent of the deal. So his K one you know, based on everything I showed you and the bonus depreciation, he invested 150,000 and he's going to get 142,000 of depreciation in tax year 2019. So Tom, I, I don't know if this is all technically correct, but I, I learned this from you and this is in my own terms. So now obviously that 142,000 could offset other passive income if he's a, he or she is a qualified real estate professional, then it could offset all their earned income or some of their earned income. It could carry forward and offset gains at sales. And then there's the whole uh, CARES Act as well that they could benefit from. And then as Tom mentioned, they, they may be able to restructure some of their business income of their business owners and reclassify that as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of potential here for somebody to take that depreciation and directly benefit benefit from it in that same tax year. Right, so just one clarification. Hey, hold on one second, Tom. Let's go ahead and stop sharing and then that way we'll jump to Tom full screen. Well, except, can... except it- Oh, you want the screen up there, okay. Share. Okay, go ahead. Okay, one clarification and that is if you're passive, you don't get to carry back under the CARES Act. You only get to carry back under the CARES Act if you create a loss and, and you're a real estate professional. So I just wanna make that one clarification. If, if, if you're passive, you don't get to carry that back because it's not a net operating loss, okay? And it's net operating losses that we can carry back, not passive losses. So passive losses carry forward, net operating losses can carry back. So if you're a real estate professional, you can absolutely carry back that, that back five years and you might have had a loss in 2018 and you were a real estate professional. You thought you had to carry it forward and now you can carry it back. If I could say, and that's why I always have a little asterisk in my presentation saying, I am not your tax advisor. I am not, <laughs> I am not your CPA. And this is my own understanding of this. And you need to talk to Tom Wilwright for these types of details. Well, and Brad, you've come a long way as we just learned. And, you know, big thanks, buddy, for you being vulnerable enough to say I used to pay too much in tax. And let's be for glad sure. that uh, Tom is here to counsel us about these things. If you want to get your mind around taxes, it takes some time, but I can think uh, you probably just had demonstrated to you that it's worth it. So if you were a little confused at what Tom was saying, you can go back and listen again, but also pick up your copy of Tax-Free Wealth. Make sure you get the updated version, which he did after the new tax law. And uh, that's a great resource for you. And of course, uh, the Wealth Ability Show, Tom's great podcast. If you're interested in learning to invest in apartments, that's a whole interesting way to go. And you can invest the three ways that uh, Brad talked about. Uh, Brad does an amazing two-day seminar called Rat Race to Retirement. Happens a few times a year and lately, both virtually and in person. So all you have to do is go to bradsumrock.com and check out the times. So gentlemen, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Brad Sumrock, the apartment king. Always good to see you. Thank you. I love that. Tom Wheelwright, CPA. Good stuff. You make taxes fun, my friend. Thanks so much. Well, it's, e it's easy to be fun when you're getting a refund, right, Brad? That's right. A lot more fun that way. Well, there's another edition of Tax Talk with the real estate guys. Remember, we're after real estate for all the great benefits that it affords us. But if you pay attention to the tax law, you can do that much better. Big thanks to Brad Sumrock and Tom Wheelwright. We'll see you next time. 
on the real estate guys. Before you go, three things. Number one, subscribe. When you subscribe, you build up our subscription base and that helps us reach more people. But even more important, it helps us attract great guests and subject matter experts to share their ideas and information with you. Number two, click that notification bell to make sure that when we do post a new video on this hot topic, you're notified right away. And number three, share. Please share this information with friends, help them get on board this bus, help them protect and preserve their wealth to take advantage of what's going on in the world today. All right. Thanks so much. And we'll see you in the next video.